Hey there, JG Berthoom. Sorry for the uh, raspy voice, not feeling too well today, but that doesn't stop me from making a tutorial. So, um, this is going to be a really quick, simple video, um, simply giving some tips on how to get your strings to sound more realistic. This is assuming that you are using the specifically Logic built-in string sample libraries. A lot of people use Logic as a DAW, and a lot of, uh, especially beginner composers, don't necessarily have the cash to fork out to buy expensive sample libraries like East-West or Cine Samples or Spitfire. So they have to, for a while, use um, the Logic orchestral samples. Now, um, yeah, there are things to be desired, but they're actually not that bad. They're much better than General MIDI, for example. You can do quite a bit with these samples. So today we're specifically going to be talking about um, getting your strings sounding really legato. Now, um, the Logic samples don't have true legato, so in case you didn't know what true legato is, it's basically where they actually sample the transition from one note to another. So for example, if you play like, you know, um, uh, C to G, like doo doo, that's probably not C to G, I don't have perfect pitch, but um, you're going to get the finger slide from the position on the fingerboard from one to another when you actually play the instrument. So they record that um, and actually transition between the first C, that little slide, and then the second note that you're playing. So long story short, it makes it sound very smooth and flowing, but we don't have that with these logic samples. So we have to sort of um, fake it, if that makes any sense. So there are a bunch of little tips that I'm going to be going through to make um, it sound fairly, fairly decent, as good as could possibly sound. So the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure that you have um, the individual ensemble patches. Sorry, not ensemble, but the individual patches open up. So for example, if you go over here to your Logic library, and I'm using Logic X, you can see we have orchestral underneath that strings. Now, don't go for one of these like cinema strings, full strings, modern strings, pop strings. Those are all going to sound fairly unrealistic. Maybe decent for like electronic stuff, but for this, for our purposes, you want to open up violence one, violence two, violas, cellos, and basses. You want to open up your individual patches. Alright, so, um, the first thing you want to do is when you open up a brand new patch, and I'll go ahead and show you, oops, sorry about that, um, uh, when you open up a brand new patch, so wait, no, cancel, let's, uh, use the right shortcut here, mm -hmm. so we open up a new patch, let's say we select, um, uh, Violins 1, um, on our left, um, inspector over here, we're going to get these two buses. Now we want to control our own reverb to get everything sounding cohesive, so you want to turn these off. So just hold the click down on this little area right here and do no send. Okay. Uh, what you're also going to want to do, um, if you want to, is go to Window and do Open Mixer. So Sorry, you probably can't see that memo, that window, but um, you can open up the mixer here. And you can actually go to, right here you'll see sm uh, Small Booth and Large Church and you can do edit, um, delete, and actually delete these channels if you don't want them taking up processing power because we're going to be using our own reverb. <clears throat> so anyway, so yeah, you're going to want to do that with all of your individual patches, take all of those reverbs off, and the first thing you're going to want to do is pan um, your violins. Now, you can opt for the traditional method, which is basically to pan the first far right, second uh, right a little bit less, maybe like, you know, First violins, 50 to the right, second violins, 25 to the right, violas in the middle, cellos 25 to the right, and basses 50 to the right. I personally think that gives a fairly unbalanced sound, especially for um, uh, um, for strings only pieces. Um, and a lot of modern film composers and mixers are actually um, having the first and second violins as well as the cellos on opposite sides. So the, what I've done here is have the first violins 40 to the left, second violins 40 to the right cellos 20 to the left and basses 20 to the right. All right. Um, and especially if you have a melody in octaves um, like we have here for the first and second violins it's gonna give a nice balanced panned sound. Hopefully you can hear that a little bit. So, um, so yeah, um, so once you get things panned, the second tip I have is with your part writing, try to have as many common notes as possible held over. And this is just goes to back to four part writing rules. But if you'll notice, the viola holds pitches um, uh, longer than everything else. I tried to write my part writing so that at least one part, you know, sometimes it's unavoidable. Like here, for example, the chord change that I had, I really had to move every um, every uh, instrument onto a new note. But you want to try to have these old notes held over as much as possible. So for example, this first chord is going to be an A minor, right? And then the uh, second chord is an E minor. So E serves as the fifth of A minor and also as the 
um, the tonic or first degree of E minor, if that makes any sense. There you go. So yeah, if you can manage to follow your part writing rules and and uh, just write well for strings in general, then it's going to sound a lot more realistic. In other words, only ever have five parts at the same time. Don't do any doubling. Um, don't use an ensemble patch and have common notes held over. And also stick well into the ranges of the violins. Now, it may be noted uh, from an orchestral perspective that strings tend to sound best with very um, uh, wide open voicing. You know, you don't want to have a lot of closed, chunky chord block chords. Um, that that those generally sound good for brass. But um, so if you're a keyboardist, be careful to not make things acclimated for a keyboard. You want to make the voicing as open and wide um, as possible. So you can see I did that here. Now the second thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to automate the volumes. Now if you click this little automate automation button, you can automate the track volume. I'm sure you already knew that if you are the least bit experienced with Logic. So yeah, you don't want to go crazy with this, but you don't want to be too subtle. I went from like negative 7 up to 0, back down to negative 7, then sort of up a little bit, and then it sort of tapers down and fades at the end. So you can hear this automation happening here. Now you might say, oh, well this is going to sound a little bit unrealistic, because um, you're not actually getting the intensity um, to, to increase and de decrease. You're only increasing the volume and decreasing the volume, which is going to sound unrealistic. Well, to a certain extent you're right, and that's another reason why the more expensive sample libraries are great. Um, because you know they record them playing pianissimo and they record them playing piano and uh, and they crossfade in between all those different dynamic levels. So you don't only get the volume increasing, but you get the actual dynamics increasing, and they'll increase the vibrato and they'll you know a violin's texture and timbre actually sounds different, and the overtone series sounds different the louder you play it. It's not just a volume increase, and you're right about that. But we have one uh, solution that can make it sound a little bit better, and that is to make sure that your reverberation is on um, an output channel. So um, you can either bus it to an individual track if you have things in the um, if you have things in the uh, <coughs> project that you want that you don't want to have the string reverb. But in this case, since we only have strings, I basically just went to the output track over here and added um, some space designer. So um, I used the big string reverb. Um, that's a very heavy, thick reverb. Sometimes it can be too much, but I like the sound of it very nice. So if you open it up, I think the default is like to have it a little bit higher, like 10. But I found that like negative 14.5 is a really good spot for the reverb level to be at, especially for like really legato string stuff, because um, it really helps glue it together. You can see what it sounds like without the reverb. Here, wait, sorry, let me. With the reverb. It really helps to glue everything together. It sounds really nice. But anyway, but that means that the automation is not going to adjust the reverb volume because the reverb is on output. So you got to be very careful to not put your reverberation on, for example, on violins, one violins, two violas, yada yada. Because the problem with that is, is that when you automate the volume, it's going to make the reverb quieter, and that's going to sound unrealistic because it sounds like you're turning an audio file down instead of turning the violin down. But the reverb always stays the same. If that makes any sense. So I hope that was a fairly decent explanation. So yeah, so always make sure that your reverberation is on. On a separate bus or on your output track whenever you're doing volume automation, otherwise it's going to sound weird. Um, you can get all curvy if you'd like, in other words you can use the uh, curve automation tool and get like you know nicer curves and stuff, but I found personally that it doesn't make a big enough difference to be worth the effort to my ears, but if you want to do that, go for it. Um, so yeah, so once you do the volume automation, the panning, and set the reverberation up correctly, then the last and final thing that you can do to make it sound realistic is <coughs> the um, the tempo track, you can edit the tempo. So as you can see, I have the tempo at about, um, let's see, I'm around like 73 here, and then it goes up to um, uh, 80. I generally don't ever want to have increases of like more than 10 BPM, otherwise it's going to be too like weird. Um, so if you just have a subtle, you know, sort of light going up and down, like, because they'll, they'll usually do that. They'll sort of speed up with the crescendo and then slow down for the release. That's how real players are going to be. Um, also, I didn't perform these in, but I would recommend, if you can, to perform your individual parts in. Um, <clears throat> because I was throwing this together fairly quickly, I just... And because of the fact, I wanted to make it um, this, you know, some a lot of uh, MIDI composers for Logic um, 
don't play the keyboard or aren't necessarily, you know, um, the best, and they like to input their notes. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, you know, you don't really have any excuses. Like you can look at this, and I, I, I hand entered all the notes, and they're quantized perfectly. But it's, it definitely is going to sound a little bit more natural if you perform your parts in, and I would recommend that you doing that if you can. Um, yeah. So also, even though it would be nice to um, uh, make the actual um, velocity for every individual note to increase, like for example, I have like, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, 70, if that makes any sense, like you can take our velocity tool right here and actually in adjust the velocity of individual notes. But what I found is that, if you'll notice, at about 109, um, there's no vibrato on the strings. There's just a very, very small amount of vibrato, whereas if you increase it more, to like, you know, 116, you get the full vibrato. So, um, was that, I don't think that was the best decision for whoever sampled these libraries. Now, I've heard, um, believe it or not, from someone that these Logic X samples are actually vintage Vienna samples, which I think is fascinating. I'm not 100% sure of that, but um, I was told by a reliable source, which is really interesting. But regardless, um, it's it's in that sense, it's poorly sampled. Um, so it, I, I find that it sounds unrealistic if you if you try to adjust the individual velocities. So I literally, if I want no vibrato, I just keep everything at under 110, and if I want vibrato, I keep it, you know, above 117. But switching between the two is going to sound unrealistic because you're going to suddenly have vibrato when you didn't have it before, and it's going to make notes sound awkward, and it's just going to be a pain. So just to let you know, if you want to make everything the same velocity, an easy way that you can do that is by selecting all of these individual tracks, double-clicking them so that the MIDI editor opens, or the piano roll. You can see all of these notes here. What you can do is select all of these notes, right? You can go to the functions, MIDI transform, fixed velocity. You're going to find this at the exact place that you want it to be. Um, so 117, and then you're going to do select and operate, and it's going to make all of them the same dynamic level. So there you go. Now the last thing that I'm going to do is show you a couple of pieces of music that I've written uh, that can show you the context, because this is just a short little demo, but I can show you, you know, the... Um, uh, uh, implementing these ideas in an actual track. Now, um, let me see if I can find the correct file here. Wonderland. Now, this was not an original track. This was actually a um, uh, <coughs> a um, uh, yeah. We'll close this project. This was a uh, sampling of uh, a. Sorry, I'm my train of thought is dying here. Uh, it is a sampling of a Broadway musical production, a song from that, so I was basically just creating an instrumental backing track for them. But all of it was sampled myself with only the built-in Logic sounds, um, and you can see how it sounds, you know, fairly, fairly decent if you do your work and, you know, make the right decisions. So, let me uh, see if I can adjust the Logic window size to be smaller. Right there, alright. There we go. We'll turn this off, and I'll go ahead and do this so you can see the entire project. Um, and you can see if I look at the volume, you know, I've done a lot of volume animation and stuff. So, all right, we'll play it.
So there you go. Um, <clears throat> I didn't compose that, just to let you know. Um, again, it was just me sampling an existing track. Um, but again, it was all done with the Logic built-in samples, so you don't have to spend, uh, you know, hundreds of dollars on samples to get things sounding decent enough, you know, to, to actually get work, especially if you're working for video games. I mean, if you're composing music for video games or doing backing tracks like this, Logic samples, you know, can be perfectly fine for the occasion, but obviously if you are wanting to do film scoring, you know, because just, I don't know, if you put music over live action, if it doesn't sound realistic, it's going to become cheesy really quickly. So there you go.